So welcome everyone for another episode of our Confabulating. Today we have the pleasure to have <laughs> Professor Peter Stone with us. Um, Professor Peter Stone is the UNESCO Chair in Cultural Property Protection, CPP, and Peace at Newcastle University in UK and the President of the Blue Shields Advisory Body to UNESCO on CPP. He has published widely on heritage management in the preparation and education. Peter was uh, Honorary Chief Executive Officer of the World Archaeological Congress. Um, and since 2003, his work was fo focused on the protection of cult cultural pr property in armed conflict and following natural or human-made disasters. He has written extensively on this topic, including co-editing with Joanne uh, Farkak uh, Bajali, The Destruction of Cultural Heritage in Iraq in 2008, and Editing Cultural Heritage, Ethics and the Military in 2011. His article, The Fort Years Approach in the British Army Review, led directly to the established of the Cultural Property Protection Unit in UK uh, forces. Nice. Uh, welcome, Pete, and thank you so much uh, for accepting our uh, invite. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to meet you, Pete. Thank you very much. I know that you have a PowerPoint to show us, correct? Yeah, if we're ready to go straight away. Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, just wait a minute, my, so, where is it indeed? Just hang on for a moment. Should be there. Ah, here we, can you see it now? Not okay. yet. Hang on. Whiteboard on your phone. Uh, here we go. No, doesn't seem, uh, oh, here, found it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So. Okay. Can you see that now? Yes. Good. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm going to be talking for about 35 minutes or so about the protection of cultural property in armed conflict, the role of the UNESCO Chair in Cultural Property Protection and Peace, CPP and P, um, and the Blue Shield. And at the bottom of my slides, you'll see two logos. Um, on the left-hand side, as I look at it, the Blue Shield International, which we'll come back to towards the end, and at the bottom right, um, the UNESCO chair logo, and uh, I'll talk about that um, in a moment. So what I'm going to cover this evening um, are four things, um, all very briefly. Um, firstly, the role of the UNESCO chair, and I'll do that very briefly. Then a, a brief history of cultural property protection, how cultural heritage experts need to work um, so that we can get our messages across, and then I'll talk at the end about the Blue Shield. Um, and as I say, about 35 minutes or so. <clears throat> so um, the UNESCO chair, um, there are about, um, it changes each year, but there are about 100, sorry, 650 UNESCO chairs across the whole spectrum of the work of UNESCO from um, uh, science, culture and education. And I am the only UNESCO chair in CPP and P um, in the world. Um, and that's uh, um, an interesting, um, unique uh, accolade. Um, I wish there were a lot more of us um, because the work would then get done a lot more quickly. Um, we are not, as UNESCO chairs, part of UNESCO. Um, we're affiliated to UNESCO, but we are fully funded by our home uh, universities. And Newcastle actually not only pays for me, but one and a half other staff to support the work I do. We um, do not speak for UNESCO, um, but we work on aspects of UNESCO's remit and obviously cultural property protection is um, a very high profile part of what UNESCO does at the moment and has done um, for the last 20 odd years or so. We're frequently in um, United Nations terminology called outside insiders. So as I say, we're not part of the organization, but we are very heavily integrated within it 
and we talk within it, but we don't talk for it. Um, I'd perhaps uh, prefer the term critical friends. Um, we know what we're talking about, we know what they're talking about, and the two don't always necessarily overlap. So that's really all I want to say um, in particular about the UNESCO chair, but it just gives you that bit of context. But the critical bit um, of context in terms of the UNESCO chair is that one of the three main objectives of the UNESCO chair, which is a four yearly renewable um, system within um, uh, UNESCO, is that the third objective is to create an efficient and effective Blue Shield organization, which is where we come back um, at the end. So that's the, the plan. So cultural property protection in armed conflict and um, all sorts of people react to that idea in all sorts of ways. The more polite ways um, are, but it's war, it's cultural damage. Come on, get real, you can't protect um, cultural property in those things. My question is, do things have to get damaged um, and can't we do anything? And I think my answer to that is no, they don't. And yes, we can. And actually, I'm in fairly good um, uh, company in many ways because, and I'm not going to go through any of this in detail, but probably for the last two and a half um, thousand years or just more than that, um, uh, philosophers and tacticians of war, um, strategists, have said that the um, destruction of your, or allowing the destruction of your enemy's cultural property, or worse still, destroying it yourself, is a bad thing to do. Because, um, or for all sorts of reasons, and all of these gentlemen here from two and a half thousand years ago um, in China, and Shao on the left, um, Polybus in um, Roman times, Hugo Grotius in the 17th century, Klaus um, von, uh, von Clausewitz um, in the early 19th century, and the, the gentleman in the middle, um, Francis Lieber, um, have all in different ways argued in their own strategic ways that this is the wrong thing to allow. And yet, of course, hundreds if not thousands of um, battles and archaeological or battles have been fought and sites have been damaged, places have been blown up, um, cultural property has been stolen as the means of paying armies, um, even though everybody says in the theory that this is a bad thing. The, um, <coughs> the earliest time I can find so far where that theory was actually transferred into practice is in 1385 in um, England, when the so-called Durham Ordinances were drawn up, the rules of engagement, as they would be called now by an army, um, what the army was allowed to do and not allowed to do um, when it invaded Scotland in, as I say, 1385. And one of the articles of this was um, a, uh, to be uh, punishable by death, not to damage religious or other cultural buildings during the invasion. So there, that transfer of theory to practice, at least as old as 1385 in Europe. Um, but it was probably not until 1863 that um, the gentleman that was in the middle uh, of the previous slide, um, Francis Lieber, who had fought at Waterloo in the Prussian army, but had moved to the United States and um, was an advisor to the federal government. And uh, Lieber produced what is commonly called the Lieber Code, but um, technically the instructions for the government of armies of the United States in the field, um, General Order 100. And Article 35 of that General Order states that classical works of arts, libraries, scientific collections, precious instruments, such as astronomical telescopes, as well as hospitals must be secured against all avoidable injury, even when they're contained in a fortified place while besieged or bombarded. And that was the first time that um, at least some of the cultural property that we talk about today was in military law um, protected in recent times, 1863 during the American Civil War. Um, there were a, a couple of other um, regulations that came from this, 
um, but uh, we don't really have time to go into that. Galloping on from 1863 to 1914 and the First World War was unlike any war that had ever been fought. Um, there was an unprecedented use of new lethal technology. Um, the trench warfare system um, epitomized that, but there was more destructive artillery, um, more uh, precise artillery, there was more air power, and there were, of course, for the first time used in conflict, tanks. And what you see in the image there is, um, okay, some British trenches, but behind it, the remains of a village and there isn't very much of that village to see and most of the western front um, looked not dissimilar to that and about the um, one of the two buildings that you see propping up if you can see my arrow there on the screen is the remains of the church tower and churches along the western front were one of the prime targets because of course you could be at the top of the church and see as a lookout um, and you were there as a, an artillery um, uh, marksman. Um, there was massive destruction along the Western Front. However, at the same time in the First World War, depending on how you look at it, the British occupation or liberation of Jerusalem um, or conquering of Jerusalem, however you want to take it, um, led to the proclamation by Field Marshal um, Allenby, the commander of the grandly titled British Empire Ex Egyptian Expeditionary Force, um, and in Allenby's proclamation, he said, every sacred building, monument, holy spot, shrine, traditional site of the three religions will be maintained and protected. And that was critical because somebody in Allenby's um, staff was actually thinking a little bit more than just about general protection. Because, and it's very difficult in this um, image um, to see it, but the British troops here, who are protecting um, this mosque in Jerusalem, are not regular British Army troops, but they are regular troops of the British Indian Army, and they are chosen from a Muslim regiment. And so somebody on Alambi's staff was actually thinking not only about protecting of culture, but protecting culture with appropriate troops. Everybody on Allenby, in Allenby's army needed something to do, and it would have been just as easy for the staff officers to allocate a British regiment to do this, but they actually were very careful and chose an Islamic regiment to do this. And as a result, with Christian troops looking after the other sites, in, including the Jewish sites, um, as a result, there was no unease during the military occupation of Jerusalem during the First World War. The unease that came about the British occupation came later in the civilian um, time, but not actually during the war, because of this proclamation and because of that very careful thinking by Allenby's staff. And we'll come back to that um, a little later. Rushing on, in the Second World War, um, in 1941, the British were accused by the Italian army of vandalizing archeological sites in Sirencenia, um, Monday, Libya. And that was almost certainly true, um, not because they were intending to vandalize the sites, but because nobody had thought about telling them not to, and not to park their tanks on what were appropriately long or large flat areas, which were, um, you know, uh, parts of ancient Roman cities and the such. Um, so there was almost certainly damage going on, unintentional, but damage nonetheless. Um, senior staff asked for advice um, from officers who'd been conscripted, um, and one in particular who was working on other duties in the war office. And um, you can hear the sort of uh, uh, the discussion going, as some uh, senior officer comes down and says, Oi, don't you know something about archaeology? And this, uh, this um, junior officer looking up and said, Well, yes, I actually know quite a lot. And they said, Great, so this is your job from now on. And um, the guy who he'd asked was actually Sir Leonard Woolley, the primary archaeologist in the UK. 
And Woolley immediately said, but I need some eyes on the ground to tell me what's going on. And somebody else said, well, there's this um, memo come in from some geezer in the artillery. Um, and the geezer in the artillery was somebody called Sir Mortimer Wheeler, probably the second most famous archaeologist in um, British archaeology of the period. And so those two and many others became the core of what then became known as the Monuments Men. Um, the uh, Monuments and Fine Arts Commission, to give it its, its grand title. Unfortunately, because most of those monuments men um, who did a remarkable job all over Europe um, were conscripted into the army, um, by the time they were all demobilized, um, very simplistically, the last one turned out the light and shut the door behind him. And there was little further contact between the military and heritage experts for the next 40 years or more. <coughs> there was a little bit of limited work done in former Yugoslavia, but, but not that much. So from probably a peak where there were odd um, mountains in the, in the First World War to a more general approach supported by the Supreme Allied Commander in the Second World War, um, there became almost nothing um, later on. But there are responsibilities under international law um, about the protection of cultural property. One that we'll talk a little bit more about um, in a moment is the 1954 Hague Convention on the protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflict and its two protocols. Um, and the, I said after the Leader Code in 1863, there were two other conventions. Those were Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, which actually um, broadened the Leader Code's fairly narrow description of what cultural property was. And the two protocols of the Hague Convention the first one in 1954 was mainly about reparation, the return of stolen goods to a country at the end of a conflict. And then the second one in 1999 about a what we call enhanced protection, a higher level of protection, which potentially gives a criminal responsibility, not only to somebody who damages cultural property, but their senior officers as well. So there's a whole issue there. But more broadly, that's the bit of international humanitarian law. But then there are also the 1977 edition protocols to the Geneva Conventions, the 1998 Rome Statute, which set up the International Criminal Court, all of which um, protect in different ways cultural property during armed conflict. And there is at the moment an initiative by the lady in the image, um, Karima Benoin, um, who is the UN Special Rapporteur for um, Cultural um, Rights, um, where she's trying to make access to cultural heritage an explicit human right um, uh, alongside the 1948 Convention. So there is a, a, a serious and widespread international legal basis. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the 1954 Hague Convention is essentially a peacetime convention because most of its primary um, activities need to happen in peacetime before conflict. So in peacetime, um, state parties to the convention are encouraged to produce lists of cultural property so that that isn't damaged during the conflict. If appropriate to identify some of those as worthy of the two higher levels of protection, special or enhanced, and I can go into that if people are interested. To put into place emergency plans to protect cultural property, either in situ or by removing movable um, heritage to other parts of the um, a, a country or even out of the country. To designate competent authorities, um, if appropriate, to mark the cultural property with the blue shield emblem. And this is the blue shield emblem which is the emblem of the 1954 Hague Convention. And you can see it down here as the centerpiece of the logo of Blue Shield International. And then there are specific military obligations in Article 7 um, that you have to include protection of cultural property into military regulations, um, but also you have to have um, specialized personnel in your armed forces um, to deliver uh, that work. 
Sadly, very few state parties to the Hague Convention, 133 or four, I think at the moment, um, have actually implemented it properly. And so we're, there's a frustrating element there, but that's what they're supposed to do. <clears throat> if we just take an example and we go to 2003 um, in Iraq, none of the coalition combat troops had any orders to protect any cultural property. Um, it appears those places weren't even marked on combat military maps. So when Donny George, who was then director of um, uh, research at the National Museum in Baghdad, went to the American army and pleaded to have some troops allocated to protect the museum, there was some concern amongst the American army um, that uh, he was um, an insurgent leading them to a trap because there was no, uh, no national museum marked on their map. And it took him a few days to convince them that actually he was real and there was a museum that um, they might have been able to protect had they gone when he first asked them to. And astonishingly and um, embarrassingly, um, neither of the two main protagonists in the invasion of Iraq, the US nor the UK, um, had ratified um, the Hague Convention or the protocols. So even though there is a whole uh, block of international law there, um, it's not very well delivered. What went wrong in Iraq? Well, firstly, there weren't enough troops deployed. Um, I could go into this in um, a lot of detail, but we don't have time. Um, there was a complete failure to comprehend the possible conflict scenarios in Iraq, which I'll touch on in a bit. Um, and there was a failure to understand the importance of cultural heritage and the historical relationships with that heritage um, in Iraq. But probably just as important um, as going wrong was the fact that the heritage community had failed to engage with the military. And um, that takes us back to 1947 when the last of the conscripted monuments men um, turned the lights out and shut the door behind him. And while there had been a little going on, there had been almost nothing that was in enough time or um, uh, in the right place um, to actually impact on the military process of that invasion. From the planning of it to the actual delivery of it, cultural property and, and CPP was simply not an issue, which of course it should have been under international law. As a result of that, the National Museum and all regional museums were looted. Um, the National Library, the National Archives and public and university libraries and art galleries across the country were looted and many of them destroyed and burned. There were hundreds if not thousands of archaeological sites across Iraq looted. There was failure to protect cultural and historic sites, buildings and monuments. And all of that built to an increased opposition to the coalition because the Iraqi population who um, to some degree welcomed the coalition invasion to get rid of the dictatorship suddenly found the coalition ignoring a key element of um, Iraqi uh, culture and identity, its historic past and its archaeological past. And that increased opposition is an issue, again, that we'll come back to briefly. <coughs> This is probably um, one of the most damning images from um, the invasion of Iraq and following this in 2006, the second targeting of the Al-Akshiri Mosque in Samara. And if you um, compare this with the very careful um, protection of Islamic sites by Allenby in 1917, which resulted in no problem. Here, the failure to protect um, Islamic mosques across the country um, caused significant problems. And this, by most commentators of the, uh, of the period, is, is critical because it is the tipping point from a population increasingly fed up with the coalition being there 
to the tipping point into a full um, sectarian civil war that required the coalition to continue to stay in Iraq for a further four and a half years, taking four and a half years of casualties, fatalities, and bad publicity, and creating and providing the oxygen in which groups such as Al-Qaeda and later um, uh, so-called ISIS, Daesh, um, to uh, grow and thrive. And much of that can be taken back, in my view, to the failure to plan properly for CPP back in 2002, early 2003, before the invasion. So one of the questions, just before we get on to Blue Shield, that I am constantly asked is, so, you know, are old things as important to protect as people? And the answer to that is simply, absolutely not, of course not. This is the tragedy of Iraq and Syria and elsewhere across the Middle East at the moment. It's appalling and you can't change that. That's the problem. However, the two, the protection of people and the protection of their things are completely intertwined and are indivisible and so I can't even speak are indivisible um, back in 1821 the German uh, playwright Henrik Heine um, argued where they burn books they will in the end burn people too and in the image of course um, you're looking at the uh, burning of Jewish manuscripts um, by the Nazis in the um, in, I think this particular image taken in 1936 um, but it, in the immediate format of the Second World War. Of course, Heine in 1821 was not um, talking about the burning of Jewish books in the Second World War or the destruction of Christian sites um, in um, parts of the Middle East, um, but was talking about the um, <clears throat> destruction of Islamic manuscripts in um, uh, Spain under the Spanish Inquisition and the burning of uh, uh, Muslims who were refusing to convert to Christianity. Um, perhaps one could argue what comes around goes around. Um, <clears throat> so how do we get across why the military and why politicians and why humanitarian organizations should look after cultural property? And for, I got involved in this in 2003, and for about seven or eight years, I got this completely wrong. And I would shout at anybody who would stand still um, for long enough for me to shout at them, that uh, cultural property was very important. It was uh, very important, especially for me and my friends, because we were the people who excavated the archeology span bit of it. Um, it was uh, important for other academics, and really they should protect it. And that absolutely was the wrong way to go about it. What I learned in about 2009-10 was that we, I had to learn a different language. Um, and the language I had to initially learn was military. And I had to turn what I wanted the military to do into something that the military wanted to do because it, was, it could be easily seen as something that could contribute to their mission success. If you're talking about anything else to the military that doesn't contribute to mission success, you will get a deaf ear. Um, so the first one is it's about the people, that indivisible link between cultural property and people. Um, and the military get that because they understand that protecting civilians is one of their prime functions in conflict and they understand um, the whole pressure of uh, the Geneva Conventions and other um, international humanitarian law and human rights law that they try to abide by as much as possible. So they realize, not only because of that link, but because of their legal responsibility, it's protected under international humanitarian law, human rights law, international customary law, and in some instances, international criminal law. The military, of course, don't choose to go to war. The military are sent to war by politicians 
and but the military need to understand the political uses that um, cultural property is put to in conflict and because they are going they may be um, part of that whole process and they need to understand what's going on and how they should manage that process there has been a huge amount of discussion about um, looting of cultural property um, giving significant financial um, support to um, non-armed state actors the likes of um, Daesh and so there is certainly some truth that um, money does go into their coffers from the sale of looted antiquities actually how much goes in nobody knows and the only way we would know that is if Daesh and all of the other groups would fill in a tax return which they're not liable to do anytime soon um, but that does actually lead into a different form of financial pressure which is post-conflict stabilization and increasingly armed forces are um, uh, required not only to win the war but also to deliver a stable country for peacetime and they have to hang around until that happens and one of the things that the military really don't like doing is hanging around after a conflict because that creates more problems for them and for the population that they are embedded in and friction um, almost inevitably results and one of the issues around allowing cultural property to be destroyed during the conflict is that in many countries in the world um, the UK being a prime example much of Europe being um, a good example but also much of the Middle East um, according to a World Bank report um, in the early 2000s those Middle Eastern countries that didn't rely on oil for their um, uh, economy um, the main issue was tourism and the main reason for tourism was cultural tourism so in other words if you allow culture to be destroyed and cultural sites to be destroyed um, there is less for rich tourists to come and see and if there's less for them to come and see that undermines the whole tourism sector and the whole economic value of that tourism sector and then of course there is the self power or force multiplier as the military call it um, of uh, good CPP um, I've shown you an example of bad CPP with the Alex Shearer mosque um, a good example is Allenby in 1917 but it's one of those things that's very difficult to measure other than the fact there wasn't a problem and it's very difficult to say that problem what the failure for a problem to emerge was down to the fact that Allenby protected all of those religious sites almost certainly that's true but it's very difficult to make that direct link so yes of course the mission first but all of those above issues must become part of the mission and if that mission is either a, a military mission or a humanitarian mission and I'll, I'll come back to that um, in a few minutes so the Blue Shield um, is a, an international NGO dedicated to the protection of heritage from conflict and disasters it's got an international board and um, at the moment uh, 27 national committees spread globally named after the emblem identified in the 54 convention and is frequently referred to as the cultural equivalent of the Red Cross um, if only um, the Red Cross is known by everybody on the planet or the Red um, uh, Crescent um, the Blue Shield is known by almost nobody on the planet um, the Red Cross has got a multi-million or billion pound um, annual revenue and annual, annual budget the Blue Shield apart from the money that Newcastle University pays has no regular income and um, we have don't have therefore the usual 12,000 um, paid professional staff deployed in around 80 countries that the Red Cross does and the Red Crescent um, so not yet we're not the cultural equivalent of the Red Cross yet um, our primary context is the 54 convention and its protocols but underpinned by wider UN for example Security Council resolutions and UNESCO strategic agendas we're also conscious of the uh, sustainable development goals and such uh, sort of um, natural disaster issues such as the Sunday Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction and we look at CPP 
as a whole force responsibility, but also an opportunity. And um, the guy pointing at the map um, there is, uh, one, in fact, one of my ex-colleagues now, he's now retired, but training and working with NATO staff in a NATO exercise about the importance of CPP in that exercise and um, that deployment. That's um, our actual formal um, uh, mandate committed to the protection of the world's cultural property, etc. I'll let you read that. Um, but the image is the um, Argentinian National Committee of the Blue Shield, um, who managed to get a six program TV series on Argentinian TV uh, about their work. Um, we protect CPP as identified in the mission. But to do that, we have to work with three areas, um, what I call the uniform services. So not only the armed forces, but also customs, police, and also um, emergency services, the fire brigade, etc. We have to work with the humanitarian sector because they have hundreds of years or at least 150 years experience of working with um, armed conflict and following disaster. And they still haven't completely taken on the relationship between um, uh, heritage and protection of people. We need to understand the political leader and media environments in the areas. And we now have formal agreements with the International Committee of the Red Cross, um, with NATO, with the UN peacekeeping deployment in Lebanon, and one that is still in process, but which we hope to finish soon, um, UNESCO. Because one of the issues around the heritage sector, where you might assume that everybody on, our, on the heritage sector is supportive of this, there is quite a lot of concern about us working so closely with the military um, to protect cultural property. And are we giving, um, has, has been criticized um, for me, um, giving a, a spurious academic legitimacy to the illegal invasion of Iraq in, back in 2003. So um, just the image on the, uh, on the right there is training the Irish Defence Forces um, who only deploy as UN peacekeepers um, in a, a CPP week-long course. We need to work together um, four times, and I'm not going to go this in detail, but long-term, that peacetime um, education for those in uniform, well, all three of those areas, heritage, humanitarian and uniformed. We need immediately pre-deployment when you're going to a particular place, what is going to be the problem? You need the during mission actually putting the theory into practice and then um, peacekeeping or post-conflict disaster and stabilization, uh, putting again that into practice. And the image you see on the right is a very recent one where We've been working with the UN peacekeeping deployment in Lebanon since 2013 and the Lebanese armed forces. And um, the white bit of that roof is a temporary roof um, that we as Blue Shield were able to put on, um, <coughs> excuse me, using the personnel and um, heavy lifting equipment of UNIFIL and LAF, the armed forces of Lebanon, um, in the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs building there um, and that white bit is the temporary roof because the um, real roof had been blown off um, following the 4th of August explosion in Beirut and if we hadn't put that temporary roof back on the whole building would have collapsed because it's the weight of the roof that keeps the building up. Um, so we were able to do that but we were only able to do that work because of the long-term work we had done with UNIFIL and LAF um, over the years. This is part of that, you see the image there, um, and that's us at the World Heritage Site of Tyre in the south of Lebanon. And the guys with the blue berets and caps are UNIFIL, um, those without any hats are the Lebanese Armed Forces. So working together and training them together um, is critical. We work with our national committees and ask them to plan and report on these six areas of activity. And again, I haven't got time to go into all of these. And if people are interested, um, I think these slides will be available on um, uh, YouTube. So we, we actually ask them uh, to work in those areas. We also um, have identified eight threats 
to cultural property. If we'd thought about those in 2002, um, there wouldn't have been nearly as much damage done. And again, I don't have time to go through all of those, but you see again in the middle there, one of my colleagues working on a different NATO exercise, um, putting in um, cultural property protection um, scenarios that make their job, the military exercise, more difficult, um, but actually more realistic. So we've had a number of successes. I'll rattle through these. Now, at last, the UK and the US have both ratified the convention um, and the UK both protocols as well. Um, we, uh, the NATO affiliated um, Civilian Military Center of Excellence um, in The Hague published a book, um, Cultural, Property, Property, Cultural Property Protection Makes Sense. That's in a series of books saying X makes sense and that's a, a key element. We've been restructuring the Blue Shield. Um, we've now got the letter of um, intent with NATO. Um, NATO have done an internal report um, and looking at a CPP doctrine um, to be developed. And that's good news. That's going to develop more over the next few months. We've now got a, a brand new cultural property protection unit in the British Army, um, eight, uh, 15 um, strong reserve officers. And there's a broader program um, similar in the USS, in the USA. Um, we did the first training course for the CPPU, um, that British Army unit in um, uh, last year, 2019. But we also train people from seven other countries alongside um, there. We've now got MOUs, as I've said, with the ICRC and UNIFIL. And we got the UNESCO chair renewed for a further, further four years um, from the 1st of January this year. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to build the capacity of uh, national committees so we all work in the same way and we all have a, we can develop our own links with our national forces. We've got a specific line on training for UN peacekeeping missions. Um, we've trained, as you saw, the Irish. We've also trained the Fijian army um, who only again deploy as peacekeepers and we've worked with UNIFIL. Um, we're developing working relations with the humanitarian sector and we're working with NATO on a, a number of areas there, but we need to work with other multinational military forces. Um, the image there is me role playing a um, Blue Shield national um, uh, committee member at a um, in the going to see sorry um, in the the first uh, CPP uh, training um, there, and you've got. Um, uh, officers from three different countries just in that image. Um, there are nine in all on the course um, and we've done the recent uh, mission to Beirut. The future for Blue Shield, we need um, increasingly the funding. Um, so if any of you know a friendly millionaire, please do get in touch. Um, for a small BSI office, um, we need about eight people to be working about this full time so we really can build towards being that cultural equivalent to the Red Cross. We need all countries in the world, not just 130 odd that we've got at the moment to ratify, but crucially implement the 54 Hay Convention. We need all of those state parties to have a national committee of the Blue Shield. We need an integrated approach across the uniformed humanitarian and heritage sectors and we will eventually become the cultural equivalent of the Red Cross, Red Crescent, absolutely. But that's not gonna be an old fogey like me. I'm laying the foundations for that at the moment. And it's these um, young volunteers from Beirut who spent most of three months volunteering, cleaning up Beirut following the um, 4th of August explosion. Um, it's gonna be in their hands actually to become that cultural equivalent of the Red Cross. That's the future. I'd like to end on a more somber note in a way, if I may, because it's very easy for me in a uh, peaceful um, England to talk about all of this and to, to talk and to present this sort of image. And what we mustn't forget is that a number of people live this on a daily basis and also, and even though I said earlier on that people always first, sometimes that decision isn't mine, but 
in a way those peoples and I'd just like to end by um, a slide showing nine people who decided um, that actually from their point of view looking after cultural property was so important that they would risk their lives and um, these nine colleagues not only risked but gave their lives for the protection of cultural property. Um, six by IEDs, two by sniper fire, one by torture and beheading. And it's to their memory that I want to work in this area and that this is so important for the world to come round and to work on together. Thank you very much for listening and I'm afraid I went over my time, but still, I hope it was worth it. No worries, Pete, it was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I probably will start with a question that we have from one of the persons who is watching us live on Facebook. His name is Ricardo and he makes the, the following uh, question slash comment, which is a question that Ricardo asks to himself and to some colleagues that are archaeologists, uh, friends of him. Uh, when, <coughs> when there was the Syrian war, uh, what, um, what could the international community uh, do to protect these places, like, for example, Palmyra, and how can we protect them for near future and to avoid any t destruction by military and terrorists? And what is the role of UN and UNESCO in this protection? I think there were about 15 questions in that. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, um, I'll try and answer them um, sort of quickly. It is very difficult to protect cultural property during conflict if you haven't prepared during peace. As I said, the 54 Convention is really a peacetime convention because you have to get everything ready in peace in case there's a war. So one of the things that the Syrians did um, very well, and I know it's not particularly um, common to say it, but the Syrian army did an extremely good job by, by effectively evacuating the majority of movable cultural heritage from the museum at Palmyra, um, literally um, sort of half an hour before um, the uh, troops from Daesh arrived. Um, so that's one thing you can do, you can move cultural property. You can't obviously move a site like Palmyra, um, it's there. What you can do is document it as well as possible um, before um, the conflict. And so again, that's a peacetime um, activity. Um, and you can uh, document any damage that is done um, to the during the conflict um, by satellite and the such. And with some of the uh, more recent attacks on cultural property, um, we've been extremely um, lucky because the protagonists have actually filmed themselves doing the destruction. So if we move from Syria just for a moment to uh, Mali and Timbuktu, um, the uh, uh, Ansandia group who took over Timbuktu um, took videos of them destroying um, shrines and a, a, a mausoleum, uh, sorry, um, nine mausolea and one mosque. And um, in most of those videos, um, there was one gentleman who was leading the group who was doing the destruction, uh, who talked to the camera. And he, Mr. Al Mahdi, um, was, as a result of that, um, taken to the International Criminal Court um, in The Hague under the Rome Statute um, for um, crimes against cultural property. And he was the first person ever to be prosecuted purely for crimes against cultural property. Others had been uh, prosecuted in the International Tribunal for Yugoslavia um, for other deeds as well as damage to cultural property. Um, and people at the Nuremberg trials following the Second World War had been as well. But Al Mahdi was the first person and he was sentenced to nine years um, for that. So you can, even if you can't protect it necessarily during the conflict, you can hunt down the perpetrators 
following the conflict. And if you continue to do that enough, and there's somebody else also being prosecuted in The Hague at the moment, um, that message will begin to get out. So it may not be very easy, but there are some things you can do. The final thing I'll just say is heritage comes at all sort of different levels. And Palmyra, of course, is a world heritage site. Um, but probably the more um, worrying bit of uh, damage to cultural property was um, in the modern town that uh, is very close to Palmyra, Tadmor. And there, uh, Daesh collected up um, the, some of the remaining men, um, gave them sledgehammers and pickaxes, and forced them to destroy their own cemetery, which had um, monuments higher than ground level, which they saw as idolatrous. And so there, in terms of the subjugation of the local population, in terms of um, tell, dominating that, that population, in terms of telling that population they had no future other than complete um, uh, submission to Daesh, um, that was much worse, even though at the end of the day, that population relies on the income from tourism um, from Palmyra um, in the longer term, as I was talking earlier. So there are very many different layers of heritage and there are different problems associated with all of those. But that's answering one question in a very long way, but there were more than one question in it. I, I would like to, 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 to do one, uh, one question because I, uh, we all have seen those images that uh, you, you uh, shared with us with um, children dead and people who, yeah. who died in, in conflict. Um, so my question is that if a country cannot protect themselves uh, or uh, their own people, uh, like we've seen in Syria, how will they protect their um, heritage? I mean, um, sometimes it's, uh, it's, uh, it's often, oftenly uh, uh, I, I heard to say that, uh, oh, but they, they, they use uh, the, the monuments to, to hide, uh, I don't know, it's a, a strategic uh, uh, strategy uh, to, um, for instance, uh, the, the hospitals, it's also, uh, they should be protected by law. And they say, well, but the, ter the terrorists are inside the hospital. So there's this political speech behind all this. And, uh, but what I see is that when a country doesn't, uh, or doesn't, because we have seen them, uh, uh, people dying in that country, how can a, a country that doesn't protect uh, their own civilians, how can they protect uh, their heritage? Because it's not also, it's not only the, the other's fault, it, it's their fault also. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. But um, that's why I say from a Blue Shield perspective, always people first. We must always try and protect the people first. But the two are indivisibly linked. The people's um, uh, heritage is intertwined with the protection of the individuals. So um, at an intangible heritage level, um, the intangible heritage is entirely tied up in the people. And if you kill the people, you kill the intangible heritage. Um, but as we've seen more recently with, for example, the Yazidi, um, the protagonists of the fighting, um, Daesh in that instance, were not only targeting the people and therefore the intangible heritage, but also their um, religious sites and their cultural sites because they wanted to obliterate any knowledge of the Yazidi anywhere at all. One slide that I, I often use, um, but I didn't put in because of lack of time this evening, um, is a site from uh, former Yugoslavia, where the population from one village um, were rounded up, um, uh, made to stand next to a large hole, and were machine gunned into the hole. And um, that hole was then filled in and capped by the rubble of their mosque, which had been completely destroyed. And so in that instance, you have the people and their cultural property being buried in the same grave. And if you don't see, you know, if, if that doesn't in a way underline that 
indivisible link, and I don't think anything will. Now, there's nothing that anybody could have done about that particular instance at the time, but that's what makes us say that protecting cultural property is really important because you are trying to eradicate um, not only the people, but the knowledge of the people, the knowledge that those people had been there um, at some point in the past. And one of the things that we're now finding in former Yugoslavia is that communities from all different um, religions are not wanting to go back and live where they used to live, but are wanting to go back and rebuild their church or mosque or whatever, because that gives them a link to their original identity and they just feel reassured that that building is back where it should be and they may not go to it other than once a year but that once a year going back is critically important to them so people first always but you can't differentiate and and pete you mentioned uh, on uh, on your interview that uh, with us that the military need to have a specialist by law but most yeah. of the countries does, doesn't have one um why do you think it's that and um how can we actually um as a society can we check that and who can we actually ask in terms of why don't you uh, why why are you, are you not uh, following the law basically yeah um, well, I mean, the, the simple answer to who to ask is, um, I suppose you write to your Minister of Defence um, and ask if um, that, uh, you know, that military has got um, people who are trained. It doesn't have to be a special unit, but it, there should be people who have got training in cultural property protection. And as I say, the UK have gone down one route of having a small unit um, uh, of specialists, the um, US have um, gone down a different route of training a lot of people who, what they call civil affairs officers, um, and they're giving them additional training in CPP. So those are just two different ways of, of achieving the same um, you know, response. Um, the Dutch have a particular unit, the Austrians have um, a unit, um, the Germans um, don't have a unit, but again, have a, a sort of an overall um, uh, training uh, in this area. So quite a lot of European countries have these units, um, not all, <coughs> um, but uh, we need that to be rolled out, you know, globally. And in, in that case, uh, who, if we, in this case, spot a country that doesn't, is not feeling these, uh, the, these uh, laws, who can we um, speak to or who can report. we, yeah, to yeah. report uh, that situation? I mean, um, unfortunately, that's where it becomes very difficult because, you know, the um, custodian of the convention, UNESCO, is all too well aware that very few countries have fully implemented the convention. Um, but they don't have any... Um, stick with which to beat um, the state parties um, to actually forf fulfill all of the, um, uh, the parts of the convention. Um, so they can encourage them, they can help them, they can produce materials which will help them. They do that, as do we, but nobody can force a country if it's not going to, um, to actually implement properly. That's the thing that sometimes it's uh, we get stuck uh, in between because yeah. uh, yes because uh, sometimes we want to to report something and uh, we have uh, uh, um, evidences and and all of that but then we have this barrier because. Uh, they, th those institutions, those uh, organizations, they say, oh, yes, I, I, I understand and we are working uh, on, on the way and forth. But the thing is that we, we civilians, we find it too, uh, too much bureaucracy and, and sometimes it's too late when, when, when it's, it's going to, when it's needed to, to be done, it should be done. And uh, sometimes it's too late to protect uh, those those buildings and, and and everything because sometimes we see we what we see and and now I I am coming back to my country, 
what we see is uh, some small details, particular details in, uh, in laws that somehow they protect the, the people from damaging the, the, the because uh, not by protecting they are da damaging. That's the, the, the thing. And, and, and when, we, when we want to save the, the, the building, the, 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 the heritage is too late. It's already done. The damage is already done. Yeah, I mean, it, that's, you know, that's the problem. You need to do it there. So um, very quickly, the, the two ways that we push things in in the UK. So if you remember, in 2003, we hadn't even ratified the 54 Convention. Um, I met with almost every minister for a 10 year period, once a year, um, asking the same question. Um, why hasn't the UK government ratified 54 convention and each year regardless of what the political party in power was i got almost exactly the same answer which was um the uk government is committed to the ratification of the 54 Hague convention as soon as parliamentary time allows <laughs> and, um i would you know then say but it's been 70 years haven't you had any time in that and they would say it's very difficult and it was only when um, there was the con uh, concern over Palmyra that a group of uh, politicians who were in power became concerned and suddenly there was a movement and it wasn't very easy. I spent most of, uh, I mean, I exaggerate, but I spent a lot of time over one year in London working with civil servants, members of parliament, members of the House of Lords, um, and ministers, um, helping them to move a bit of in, uh, internal legislation, which had to be passed before we could ratify the International Convention. And it was, um, and again, I, I don't mean this to, you know, praise myself, but I wrote an article um, in 2013, which eventually was originally published in an archaeology journal, and which um, was then republished in a, um, a British Army journal and um, from that it was about the first time that anybody had phoned me up from the British Ministry of Defence without me pestering them to do so and I got somebody who phoned me up and said Prof Stone you don't know me but my name is um, uh, in fact Lieutenant Colonel Tim Purbridge and I think we should talk um, and it was from that conversation that Tim was able to move through the British Army, the process of instigating and finally setting up the CPP unit. Um, so you just have to keep pushing away and ticking away and talking in, critically to the right people in the right place at the right time, and be they politicians or people in uniform. Yeah. And in this case, the media uh, plays an important role as well, because Absolutely. by my experience, the best <laughs> the best replies ever that we get on the group. It's basically when we went to the media with, with the cases, uh, which is quite quite remarkable. But it, the, the, yeah, they, they do a great job in that sense as well. And it's mm -hmm. quite uh, pivotal. Um, just one question, Peter. Does the Blue Shield Committee, because I've been reading about the, the Blue Shield and uh, do they do they act in terms in international level only or at a national level as well on the country that the committee is on yeah we do we do both so there is an international board um, supported by this small secretariat of one and a half people at Newcastle University and that board is made up of um, four representatives of what we call the founding four organizations. So the international heritage organizations for museums, monuments and sites, for libraries and for archives. Um, they have four reserved places there. Um, there is an elected president of the Blue Shield. And then there are four elected members of the different national committees um, who are elected to that board. And that, that group, the secretariat and the elected board are known as Blue Shield International and we work as I say sort of at that international level with multinational um, forces like NATO for example it's um, that board that signs the MOUs with the ICRC for example 
But at a national level, um, we encourage all national committees to work closely with their politicians, with their armed forces, um, to either, if their country hasn't yet, to ratify the 54 Convention, or if it has, for them to implement it properly. Okay. And as, as you saw, we've got those six areas of activity, which we ask all national committees to work to, but they can prioritise them in the, the national situation. So there is um, sort of um, a form, but flexibility. Okay, good. And in this case, why do you think there is a need for a Blue Shield organization to exist? Um, Having UNESCO and obviously. Um, UNESCO uh, is a great organization. Um, it has um, a couple of problems. One, it has very little money. Um, and two, it is um, an organization based on state parties. So it reflects the wishes of the state parties. Um, Blue Shield is a completely, even though we have national committees, BSI exists in a way like the ICRC as a fully independent, neutral organization. So we can do things that UNESCO can't, obviously they can do things that we can't, but we are subtly different and we um, you know, work together um, in a very coherent way um, and not least partially through my UNESCO chair. So I work closely with my UNESCO colleagues and through that try to develop Blue Shield in a way that complements, doesn't um, overlap with UNESCO. And you are doing a remarkable job. Let yes, just, just, just let me ask you one thing, because uh, you spoke about uh, uh, political parties. And um, we, uh, what we, we've seen is, uh, is, is that it's, uh, it's a little bit like UN. Um, whenever there, there, there are political or, uh, uh, I don't know, country interests, uh, interests uh, that uh, in that point, can we think that uh, the cultural uh, and the heritage can be um, in danger? I mean, uh, if, uh, if there is no uh, political agreement, if there is no um, cohesion, if it's this, because we, like you, 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 you uh, showed us in Jerusalem, there were Christians, Muslims, and they were really very well placed and, and they working together they, they, they were able to protect the, the, the heritage when countries when countries do not uh, um, work together because of political you know differences can that be a threat to the, the political to, to the, the cultural and, uh, and heritage uh... oh of course it can and um, it, it, it will be if um, until we uh, get universal acceptance that protection of cultural property is an important thing um, to do in armed conflict and also let's not forget following natural disaster um, then um, it won't always be protected and there are lots of people who will put it really low down the priority list many people in uniform see it as a very low priority um, because, you know, their job, which I fully understand, even though I might, you know, disagree with some of the, the sort of process of it, but I fully understand that the military's job is to win the conflict. And to win a conflict, you have to do things that most people wouldn't want to do, like, you know, kill people and do a lot of damage. Um, the military are actually, um, in many instances, as far as I've um, come across, some of the last people who want to go to war um, because many of them have been there before and they know how horrible it is. Um, but they also understand or believe that there is a, a, a responsibility and a duty for them to you know, protect their country or protect other countries depending on what, what they're doing and how they're doing it. So I'm not gonna you know, criticize the military for what they do, um, but I try to encourage them to understand that in, again, military language, 
protection of cultural property can be a force multiplier, something that actually makes their job certainly not more difficult, but can make it easier and can lead to them therefore taking fewer casualties and leaving the area of operation sooner. And that's really what they want to do. Yes. True. Peter, I don't want to take more from your time. Uh, just probably as a last question, um, if people want to help uh, Blue Shield and want to become more active uh, for everyone who is uh, watching us, what can they do? Uh, right, and this is of course where I should um, know, but if you put in Blue Shield International into a Google search, um, you will find our website. And so that's the first place to, to go and have a look. Um, First thing to do, I suppose, there is to check if there is a national committee in your country. And if there is, um, then contact them and see if uh, you can help them. If there isn't, talk to a few colleagues and look at the section on the Blue Shield website about setting up a, a national committee and look about what you should be doing, um, you know, to set up uh, that sort of thing. As I said, um, I think when we were talking before, maybe it was when I was when I was talking, um, I'm an old fogey and I'm, you know, going to retire in the not too distant future. Um, the future is in, you know, looking at the screen in the hands of um, your generation. And you need to get involved now um, to make sure that, you know, you can build hopefully on the foundations that I, and it's not just me, there are a lot of us, um, are building um, for you to build the rest of the structure on so that um, you really will be the cultural equivalent of the Red Cross in 50 years time, it may be 100 years time. But if we all work together on it as quickly as possible, we will begin to bring that time much closer than if we did nothing. And if we did nothing now, then it would be up to you to start laying the foundations. So um, the work that the board is doing at the moment and other colleagues around the world um, are doing at the moment is laying those foundations for your generation to come along and uh, and carry the banner. And thank you so much thank for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for accepting our invite and thank you for being here with us uh, tonight. Thank you so, so much. Not a problem. Thank you very much for the invitation. And thank, thank you so much for your work. <laughs> and thank, thank you, everyone watching us okay. as well. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Me. Whoever you are out there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay,